talk about a new data analysis scheme called bounded component analysis and our algorithmic framework developed for the bounded component analysis. So I will start with um, assuming a basically interdisciplinary audience. I will try to enter the subject from the principal component analysis, which is a known scheme, um, and then introduce the blind source separation problem. Um, for which we offer this bounded component analysis as the uh, solution. But the most popular solution for blind source separation is the independent component analysis. So I will talk about that too. And then introduce the bounded component analysis. And then later, the main contribution part is the geometric framework that we developed for bounded component analysis. And give the flavor of the use of bounded component analysis in different applications and just talk about some recent results and ongoing uh, research in this subject. So I, we start with actually, we assume that we just have n data vectors coming from any application. Um, so, and we assume that they're centralized. So we subtracted their sample mean from them so they're centralized there on the origin. Um, so they lie in a q-dimensional space, so each vector has q components in it. So we have n such vectors. So the goal in principle component analysis is, uh, one of the goals is basically to identify the essential subspace where our data lies in. So we have a q-dimensional ambient subspace, but we, our data actually lies in, may lie in some smaller dimensional subspace, and also determine the main directions of variation, orthogonal directions of variation, um, which we call as the principal directions. So that's actually obtained by doing singular value decomposition over the um, data uh, snapshot matrix, which is formed by basically concatenating these vectors in the global matrix. And basically these U1, U2, UP are the principal directions and these are the coordinates of our vectors in the given uh, principal direction. So we find the projections of our uh, data vectors in these principal directions. So, um, so essentially we decompose our given matrix in the form of um, a tall matrix H containing the principal directions and V which contains basically the um, coordinates of our vectors with respect to these basis vectors that we pick. So therefore, we can write each of our data vectors in terms of these new v vectors containing our coordinates with respect to these principal vectors. One interesting property of these v vectors is that if we look at the sample covariance matrix for that, it's a diagonal matrix. So we obtain actually uncorrelated coordinates out of this transformation, um, which means we write our original data vector in terms of some uncorrelated components. So we write our original data vector as a linear combination of some uncorrelated signals. So, um, or we can write those uncorrelated components as basically a linear transformation of our original vector by finding this W matrix, which is nothing but just the pseudo inverse of our H matrix. So uh, therefore, for this is V vector is also interesting in that sense that we can find some uncorrelated components for our vectors, but it's not really unique. We can find many uncorrelated components for a given uh, data set, and that's basically we can find a unitary matrix and do a transformation on that V vector so that the resulting vector is still uncorrelated. Um, so, uh, but an interesting question is given, uh, can, can we find the theta matrix which basically produces not only uncorrelated S but also independent S. So that of course assumes that you have some underlying stochastic background where the S are samples coming from that uh, underlying uh, statistics. So this, is, so this question is actually independent component analysis. So we try to find independent factors for our original data vectors. Okay. But before addressing that, independent component analysis is the 
most popular solution for the blind source separation problem. So let me first describe what blind source separation problem is and then introduce independent component analysis as the solution for that. Blind source separation problem is nothing but a linear inversion problem. So you have this mixture vectors xk which are linear combinations of these s sources. So this system takes these s sources, mixes them and produces mixtures. So this is just a linear mapping. So it doesn't really look interesting in the sense that we want to use these observations to estimate the inputs of our linear system. So this is just a linear system of equations with one small problem that we don't know what h is. So we want to solve this without knowing what h is. Only thing that we have access is the samples of it, the, the system. Uh, so we have a couple of mixture vectors to work on and basically uh, work backwards to obtain original sources from these samples of mixtures. So there are different applications where this appears. This is actually a very rich field. But this is the prototype problem, which is called the cocktail party problem, where a bunch of people gather in a party and basically they chat and we plant some microphones around. Each microphone picks up from different signals from different uh, people. So we have different weighted combinations of speeches at different microphones. So we want to process these received mixtures to obtain uh, original voices. But the problem is we don't know how they mixed. So that's the main problem. Um, another application where um, blind source separation approaches are promising is the uh, brain source separation. So we have some neural activities inside the brain, which causes actually voltage differences around the scalp. So you basically plant some electrodes around the scalp to measure them. Each electrode receives a mixture of these sources, but we don't know how they combined. So we take these uh, mixtures and process it through this blind source separator to obtain individual uh, neural sources. Or another application is communication, where we have multiple communication transmitters transmit their signals to the same base station and they are using the same channel, same frequency, um, but they propagate differently. So we have multiple antennas at the receiver. So each antenna receives different mixtures of these users. Um, so from these antenna recordings, we would like to obtain individual transmitted source signals. So that's the application. So we can actually extend this, for example, to hyperspectral remote sensing. There are applications in DNA sequencing. There are, people also talk about applications of even finance to find hidden factors and so on. Uh, so therefore, this blind source separation problem where you receive mixtures and try to identify sources is a very basic problem, as basic as linear systems of equations. As I said, the main problem is we don't know the mixing system H. So we sort of exploit some side information to resolve this uh, hard problem about hardship about not knowing H. One popular approach is to assume that these sources are actually samples of uh, independent stochastic processes where these components are independent of each other. So that's basically the ICA approach. So in the ICA approach, as I said, um, we receive these mixtures, which we assume that they're coming from these independent sources. So we try to find a separator matrix W, which takes these mixtures and produces these outputs, which are basically, hopefully, independent as the sources does. And you can prove that if you achieve independence at the output, you will achieve separation of sources if the sources are independent. So when the independence condition is achieved, then the joint density of these sources can be written as their marginal densities. So that's the independence condition. So how you do that? Um, you typically start with a PCA like stage to first obtain uncorrelated components. But uncorrelatedness is not really separative property. There are many uncorrelated components that you can come up with. So um, by applying a PCA-based procedure, then from these uncorrelated components, you find a unitary matrix theta so that 
you preserve uncorrelatedness but achieve independence at the output. So that's basically the two-step ICA procedure, although there are some other alternatives to that. Um, and how do you do that? You formulate that as an optimization problem where you try to minimize a cost function which measures um, the dependence among the sources. So we want to minimize the dependence and usual uh, cost function is the mutual information or some cost functions basically obtained by um, base, uh, approximating or changing the mutual information. Of course, you have this constraint that this matrix is a unitary matrix so that you remain in the unitary uh, uncorrelated domain. Now, we finally came to the bounded magnitude, bounded component analysis, where now um, in the independent component analysis, we assume that the sources are independent of each other. This is sort of a strong requirement, and it's questionable in several applications. So if we know that these sources are bounded magnitude, we can actually relax that constraint about the independence and bring a actually more applicable constraint. And that basically brings us the bounded component analysis. So here, knowing that these sources are bounded in magnitude, uh, we replace the independence assumption with a much weaker assumption. So this is the independence assumption, which requires that the joint density of sources is equal to product of their marginals. We replace that requirement in terms of the support set of the density of these functions um, being the support set of the joint density is actually, so this is the convex hull of the essential support set of the PDF. That should be actually the Cartesian product of the individual um, source support set. So just to illustrate that graphically, um, for two sources, the independence assumption is given by the joint density being equal to product of marginals, um, which can be pictured like this. So this blue curve here is um, the marginal density of source one, this red one is marginal density of source two, and the joint density here, the surface, should be the product of these two functions. So that's the independence requirement, which is rather strong. In the domain separability case, in the BCA uh, assumption, we basically have a weak condition about the support set. So the joint density uh, support set is equal to um, Cartesian product of these, where when I say support set, it's actually the convex hull of the region where the PDF is not equal to zero. Um, so on top of that, we can have arbitrary joint density, which means that our sources can be um, dependent, even correlated. So we can have, so with this in mind, actually, if we sort of do a fuzzy drawing like this, um, for the bounded sources, BCA actually provides a larger framework uh, than ICA, which assumes the independence of sources. We allow sources to be not only independent, but also dependent, even correlated. Uh, furthermore, even if the original sources are independent, um, the data snapshot that we have may not be sufficiently long to reflect that behavior. So, so they may still look like dependent, but the BC algorithms being immune to dependence among the sources um, will basically have uh, not have problem, unlike its IC counterparts, which try to exploit that independence property. So a brief history, the use of boundedness first appeared in the, uh, the, within the IC itself, independent component analysis, by the uh, pioneering work of FEM. Um, and I also had some contributions, again, within the IC framework for the separation of communication sources, which are basically bounded, so we exploit boundedness property. And Vrins also had similar uh, approach around the same time frame. But as an important contribution, Cruz has recently showed that if you have boundedness property provided, you can actually eliminate the independence property with a weaker assumption. Um, so that he coined the term bounded component analysis. And in 2012, I basically developed algorithms for uncorrelated source sources. For first, 
which are can be dependent. And recently, we have a geometric framework, which I'm trying to going to explain, um, which can also separate correlated sources as well as de independent dependent sources. Um, so, and we have recently extended this. Uh, with my graduate student for convolutive mixtures, which I will briefly describe later. So let me actually try to explain our main contribution point, which is the geometric framework for the bounded component analysis. For that, we basically define two geometric objects based on our separator outputs. So these dots basically represent, for example, this for um, the three-dimensional case, these dots represent our separator output samples. So we define two objects. The first object that we define is we call it as principal hyperellipse. It's nothing but the hyperellipse whose principal semi-axes basically are aligned with the principal uh, component directions. So we can write it as an ellipse centered around the mean of our um, separator output, so it's centered around the mean of these samples, and it's basically directions, principal semi-axis directions are aligned with the principal components, so it comes from the covariance of um, these separator output samples, so this is the sample covariance matrix. So this is the first geometric object that we define. The second geometric object is even simpler, this is the bounding hyper-rectangle, so this is this is nothing but a bounding box, smallest bounding box, containing our samples. So that's where we utilize the bound boundedness of sources. So it's the bounded box, bounding box, uh, smallest bounding box, which aligns with the coordinate axes. Um, so we call it as the bounding hyperrectangle. So we have these two objects, hyperellipse, hyperrectangle. We define our criteria as, as maximizing the relative uh, ratio of the volumes of these two objects. So this is one of the approaches. So we basically maximize the volume of the hyperellipse uh, to the volume of that bounding box and that will achieve uh, separation. So remember the objects we have, this is the hyperellipse coming out of our samples, output samples. So it's actually, its volume is related to the proportional to the square root of the determinant of the sample covariance matrix. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. So this is with respect to the coordinate system. Right? That's right, that's true. So we have a fixed coordinate system that we pick which are basically our separator outputs. So the bounding hyperrectangle is defined in terms of um, smallest box aligning with that coordinate axis. One of the maximizations over the um, this is actually maximization. the maximization in, in terms of that W matrix that we have, which is, um, so we don't do any coordinate transformation over the separator outputs. We just multiply those separ uh, mixing uh, mixtures with that separating matrix W, if I answered your question. So we have this uh, ellipses volume given by the determinant of the sample covariance of the separator outputs and the volume of the hyper rectangle is even simpler which is just product of its sides and the sides of this bounding hyper rectangle is nothing but ranges of each output component which is defined in terms of the maximum of that output component minus minimum of that output component over all sample vectors. So this is how we define the volumes um, so why should this work? Um, so this basically sort of looks like a complicated picture, but it's basically a simple idea. So this is the source domain. So these are the sources, assuming three sources, just to give a three-dimensional picture. Um, and these are separator outputs. And G here is basically combination of separating and mixing system. So it's the overall mapping from sources to the separator outputs. So we would like ideally this G to be identity or basically we cannot really achieve identity, but we will settle for permutation matrices, diagonal matrices and so on. So that we, if you look at this mapping, um, um, the pris, one interesting observation is that the high 
hyper ellipse at the output, principal hyper ellipse, it's the image of the principal hyper ellipse at the input. So their volumes are related to each other by determinant of g. So this volume of this is scaled version of this volume of this hyper ellipse, which is determinant of g. Um, whereas in terms of bounding boxes, we don't have that relationship. The image of this green bounding box at the source domain is actually this hyper parallel pipe at the output, um, which is this green one. So actually this green guy has is equal to volume of this uh, bounding box times the determinant of G, but our bo bounding box at the output is the blue one, which contains that green hyperparallel pipe. So its volume in general is greater than or equal to uh, determinant of G times the bounding box volume here. So which means that the ratio of the uh, volumes is great, is actually, uh, so one of them is scaled by determinant of g, the other one is scaled by something greater than or equal to determinant of g. And we can make that equal to the gain for the bounding box determinant of g if that hyper parallel pipe becomes the hyper rectangle. And that is achieved when g is diagonal so that this guy, this green box becomes the blue box or g is equal to the permutation matrix or g is equal to permutation times the diagonal matrix which we call a set of perfect separators. So we will be happy as long as we achieve this condition. So um, therefore we can write our objective here uh, more explicitly in terms of sample covariance as well as ranges of our separator outputs. So we can actually show that by more formally um, the global maxima of this objective function are perfect separators. Mm -hmm. um, and we can actually define alternative um, optimization approach where we can put these ranges of our separator outputs into single vector range vector and we can actually replace the volume of the bounding box with the norm of the uh, that range vector and it will still so you can show that the global maximum of this so this is a, essentially if you think about the three dimensional case this is the length of the main diagonal measured by any n norm here so you can actually um, show that the global maximum of these are perfect se separators and just I will not really go into the details but Based on this objective functions, you can write iterative algorithms to obtain W, where this is your current point, and you basically add some component to that to go to the next W, and you do that iteratively several times. And this component here tries to maximize the volume of the hyper ellipse. This component here tries to minimize the bounding box, and basically we can give the similar expression as I said, I'm not going to go into the details of that for the second algorithm type. Rather than that, I want to give you a feeling about how the outcome of this works. So if you look at some applications, a visual application is image separation, uh, where I take five images. Um, so these five images, I mix them through some random mixing. So I obtain these images, which are my random mixtures. So if you look at the original images, especially the first two ones, they are highly correlated. So they are correlated with each other. And in fact, if you try to apply independent component analysis to that, a known, best well-known algorithm called FAST-ICA, FAST-ICA is not able to separate them due to this correlation. So they are not independent, they are correlated. So if we try to apply BCA, we get almost perfect result and separate these original sources, of course, with some minimal distortion. So from these random mixtures, we obtain our outputs. So this correlated picture outputs. So another application, digital communications, multiple users transmit to the same uh, base station with multiple antennas. Each antenna receives different linear combinations of these users. So we assume a setup with eight users 
we can give arbitrary length. Four users use four QAM signals, which means that they are basically, these are complex numbers. This is a complex plane. At each transmission interval, they transmit one of these four complex numbers. Um, for other users, 16 QAM, they transmit each of these 16 uh, complex numbers at each interval. So we have eight users, four of them are using this scheme, four of them are using this scheme. So if we look at antenna signals, where we assume we have 16 antennas, each antenna actually receives linear combination of them, so the received signal are not clear as the original constellations. But if we apply the BC algorithm from just the received samples at the antennas, we can actually cons uh, generate our original constellations of 4QAM and 16QAM. Um, and if we look at actually the performance of the bounded component analysis with respect to the ICA algorithms, um, we can see that, especially for this is block length, uh, so the number the number of data samples that we use versus the separation performance, especially for short separation, short data lengths, um, although the original sources are independently generated in this time, the data length is not really sufficient to reflect that. So bounded component analysis is still has higher performance than the independent component analysis algorithms. So although the sources are independent. So another application, this is the EEG data processing, so brain signal processing. So we plant, as I said, there are some voltage variations across the uh, scalp. So we put some electrodes, in this case it's 32 electrodes. So this is actually data coming from uh, some um, EEG lab software tool. So we this is actually coming from an experiment where, where at second one they introduce some target picture and the user is supposed to press a button after that target picture appear. Um, so basically there are some variations in the scalp signal. So the goal is to analyze where that source is coming from. It's so so we apply BCA to this data, just single epoch data, just that uh, uh, samples that I've shown. So we can actually obtain some scalp pictures for these components. And basically, for example, this one, if we take this, the first component, uh, we can image that component back to its basic the dipole location through some algorithm. So we can localize some region in the brain that has uh, impact on that picture and if we look at the blue curve that you see it's the um, denoised version of that signal co corresponding to that component purple line is the introduction of the target object that the um, that's shown during the experiment so you can see the change clearly for that component mm -hmm. um, so finally I have limited time so if we look at the extensions um, in the examples that I shown you the mixtures at time k were linear combinations of sources at time k this is called the instantaneous setup um, but there's actually convolutive problem where the mixtures are actually linear combinations of not only sources at time k but at previous times so it's space-time mixing um, so this is called the convolutive problem um, where the mixtures are basically obtained through such convolution and we try to obtain our so original sources through also convolutive mi mixing. So we actually extended our approach with my uh, graduate student Hussein um, and successfully applied it to convolutive case. Um, we also have analysis about the behavior of these algorithms. Um, we shown that actually as an important result these iterative algorithms converge to either global optima or to some settle point which can be perturbed to go into the global optima. And finally, um, we have some bounded component analysis MATLAB toolboxes under preparation by um, our work study student, Ozcan. So we will actually just distribute these algorithms for uh, use.
in different applications. So I will stop here, and if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them.